Your commentators, Hugh Porter and first, Phil Liggett. Almost a year to the day, the Australian Shane Sutton returned to the milk race to defend his title in the opening time trial of Bridlington. Five, four, three, two, one, go! It had been only short, but it had hurt, and Shane Sutton finished in 16th place. He wasn't too unhappy, though, with four of his Banana Falcon team filling the top nine positions. And the man who was fastest of them all was John Clay, and the rider who would wear the first leader's yellow jersey on the opening stage. Clay's time, 3 minutes, 7.9 seconds, forcing two riders from the Soviet Union, Abramov and Dolnishka, into second and third places. In this year's milk race, there were 17 teams, and five of them were professionals. This is the only race on the British calendar which is open to both classes of rider. The Banana Falcon team was the team to beat from Great Britain. So, too, six riders brought together under the mark British professionals. There were also professional teams from Belgium and Holland. The amateur teams were led by Great Britain and England, with young riders who were expected to do well. There was a strong team from Australia, and equally strong, too, from Czechoslovakia, Ireland, and New Zealand and Poland. Romania were here for the first time since 1973, and they were not thought to be strong in depth. The opening stage, stage 1A, started on Monday morning between Bridlington and Hull. A ride of only 88.7 miles, but it included some of the toughest small hills in the Wolds. Morning dawned quite bright, but there were threatening clouds and there was a strong wind blowing. There were 100 riders facing the starter, and they knew they faced a tough day on the road to Hull. The headwind start from Bridlington at first kept them all together. But once they changed direction and headed out into the narrow roads of the Wolds, the field began to break up. Through the snaking corners in the beautiful village of Grindale, three miles ahead, the first climb of this year's milk race at Forden. And it was here where Peter Longbottom, riding his ninth milk race for England, broke away with four other riders for company. They included Jibinyev Spruk of Poland, one of the danger riders, and Bob Rasenberg from the Netherlands. This was the very first attack of the day, and the field behind were now in the narrow roads. If you're caught at the back of the large field in this countryside, then the problem is, how do you get to the front? The field continued to counter the moves, hoping to catch up. But eventually, a front group of 31 riders formed, and on the narrow roads, they were out of sight and out of mind. Bob Rasenberg was still in the leading group, so too was Peter Longbottom. But they'd been joined now by some of the strongest riders in the milk race, including three from the Soviet Union. One of them, Pavel Tonkov, the world junior champion in 1987. Halfway through the stage and the riders were now climbing Gallery Hill and one rider who was enjoying his ride around the Wolds was Tom Bamford from New Zealand. He had already won two climbs and was now about to win a third. Harry Lodge from Salisbury who rides for a Belgian professional team was in second place and he was being challenged here by the Soviet rider Dmitry Cherskashin. Bamford was building a big lead in the King of the Mountains and this was only day one. He was joined at the front now by Adrian Timis a former Tour de France rider who's enjoying an excellent start to the season. The leading group of 31 riders were always splitting up, and there was an attack too by Chris Walker, who joined Adrian Timmis. 
after a while it looked like succeeding. Two riders, both from Sheffield, and both intent on winning in Hull. These two riders had tried to slip the rest of the 31 rider breakaway, and their attack and counter-attack was also meaning that the main field behind was dropping further and further back. The deficit now, 12 minutes, and Hull wasn't too far away. It already meant the milk race was coming down to a battle of just 31 riders. The rest were now losing too much time to threaten, even though there was still 12 days to go to Liverpool. The reason the breakaway was proving so successful was most of the teams had their riders up front. The teams that had missed out were Australia, Romania and the Netherlands. They had no one here, while the Banana Falcon team had four riders, and so too particularly did the Young England team. And they were riding here in the dark blue jerseys. Then, with exactly 20 miles to go, the Soviet rider, Vladimir Abramov, tried to go alone. He's come to Britain largely as an unknown rider, but after his tremendous performance in Bridlington, where he'd finished second, the rider should have marked his number more closely. Into South Cave, and it was Tonkov who was blocking the field at the front for his teammate. His teammate was going clear, and the lead was now up to one and a half minutes. The question was, would he make Hull before the field caught up? In miles, the Soviet rider seemed to have the stage won and the £1,000 safely banked. But what he didn't know was, the last six miles of this race was on wide open dual carriageway and the riders could see him all of the way. Tom Bamford was now the new leader in the King of the Mountains. But all of the riders here could now think of taking the £1,000 stage winner's prize in Hull because the hapless Abramov was caught exactly five miles from the line. Into the city of Hull and just a small circuit of the city centre to come and the riders fighting out the first place. All of the riders coming in this big bunch would be given the same time, but for the first three riders over the line there were small time bonuses, so the man who won the stage could expect to be the new race leader. And in the big sprint for the line, Chris Walker getting his eighth win of the year and with it too, the leader's yellow jersey. So John Clay, who finished in this leading group two, wouldn't be too disappointed at losing the overall lead because it was only going to pass over to his teammate Walker. The Banana Falcon team, it seems, this season can do no wrong for the team. It was their 18th win at the very start of the year. Chris Walker had beaten Zbigniew Scruff in the sprint, while the main field came home almost 15 minutes behind. Their milk race already was now out of the window, and the riders facing just a three-hour break before an evening criterium around Hull. Is this uh, Do I need to close? Is it a close criterium stage from Portsmouth? Yes, Chris, I'm afraid it is. And all of the 17 teams, after a three-hour break, faced a 30-lap circuit race around the city centre. It's the sort of stage that nobody likes to ride, but this race is all about time. Time is gained and lost over the shortest of distances. In such a large field and with many corners, the circuit race is always feared by the riders. One of the main losers was Steve Douse, a back wheel puncture, a fall and a cut left leg, and he lost over a minute and a half, and earlier in the day he gained almost 15 minutes when he'd finished 11th. In the sprint for the line, it was Chris Walker again in the centre, but this time, Jan Bogart, winner of five stages last year, opened his account this time with victory in the criterium. But the second place for Chris Walker and the small-time bonus made sure he kept that leader's yellow jersey. It had been a perfect start to the milk race for the Banana Falcon team with two stage wins and the race lead. Now it will be over the bridge to Cleethorpes. England's amateurs had had a good day one, placing four of their six men in the key break to Hull. And then after the evening criterium, Paul Curran, a reinstated amateur, lay ninth, and Simeon Hemsall two places lower. Hemsall, last year's hotspot sprint winner, was over from his base in France, where he's had five recent runner-up spots. Tactics for the day would be pure and simple, for the well-drilled Banana Falcon squad not to let any danger men give them the slip. The 28 riders lay within 42 seconds of yellow. 
There was a cold northeasterly wind blowing and rain in the air as the 97 starters pedalled away from Cleethorpes, and the yellow jersey was taking no chances against the cold in the early stages. Everything, it seemed, stopped for the milk race, even British Rail, to watch the colourful express go by. Forty miles covered leaving Brig, five were now ahead. Belgian Peter Nasons of the Kalstrop team, who'd taken five miles alone to join Jesse Sikora of Poland, Dutchman Ido Elfrink, Kiwi Tim Porson and Matthew Bozzano, the Australian champion. The five were no threat and were given their freedom. And this man, Matthew Bozzano, was already a thousand pound better off for he'd won a special sprint in Gainsborough. But behind, two more Romanians had called it a day, leaving just one to carry on. And after only one and a half days of racing, what a poor effort. The front five, who'd been almost four minutes ahead at one time, were now being rapidly chased down by the flying bunch over the three five-mile finishing loops in Lincoln. Anxiety was clearly starting to show. Race leader Chris Walker, followed by Adrian Timmis, were first to make contact with the tiring leaders the second time at the steep cobble Michael Gate climb. This move pulled eight new men away for the closing two loops. Russell Amateur Road champion Simeon Hemsall, who'd stopped on lap two with his chain off, was the master of the final ascent and burst into Castle Square to take the stage from the yellow jerseyed Walker. Hemsall's victory was a sweet birthday present for his mom, who was in the stand. He'd also moved up to second overall, 18 seconds behind Chris Walker, who remained in yellow. Stage three was a pan flat 115 miler from Skegness to Norwich through Lincolnshire, Cambridgeshire, and Norfolk. Ten riders forged ahead from the gun, and by the picturesque village of Waynefleet, with six miles covered, they gained 33 seconds. But then there was drama, for the race should have turned right to Boston, instead they went straight on. The whole race had to stop, and Phil Liggett, the technical advisor and my co-commentator, had to halt the riders. That's him in the red, it didn't go down too well. What had happened was the rooting arrows had turned with the wind, showing the course as straight on. All the entourage has turned round and total mayhem reigned. And after about 15 minutes, they were ready to start the race again. Gordon Harling, the commissary in charge, set the leading group up and they were allowed to set off with their 35 second advantage and they were quickly back into their rhythm. Rob Langley of the Great Britain team was first to move away, followed by the black jerseyed John Walshaw of the British professionals. Walshaw out to add more points to his tally in the hotspot spring competition. He did that as he was first over the line in Boston. A first chase from the main field developed with three Russians, Dmitry Chakachin, Vladimir Abramov and Andrei Dolgish spearheading the charge, which caused the group to splinter into three segments as they reeled the escapees in. As one move failed, almost immediately, entering Cambridgeshire, another formed. John Hughes of the Great Britain team, John Loner of the USA, and Mark Walsham, the British professionals, who were having a good day, and they went clear. The longer term. Huh? Longer term. Long time, John. Loner had to do more work on the front and stop moving over so quickly. That's what was required. Field, led by Paul Curran, were in pedestrian mode through Down and Market, trailing the leaders by almost eight minutes. This swelled to a maximum of 14 and a half at one point. And as they approached the finish, after 70 miles ahead, they began finessing. Hughes in the white had recently won the Franco Bell, so was clearly in good form. But Mark Walsham, the man in the pink, is one of the fastest professionals on the British circuit, so he would be expecting to win this. Walsham was nursing an injury of four stitches in his right knee from a crash the week before, but it didn't stop him taking his third milk race stage victory in eight years. What a ride. Five and a half minutes later, Kiwi Darian Rush snatched the bunch sprint, which contained Chris Walker, the yellow jersey. That meant no change in the overall top positions. Walker on the extreme left. Sportingly, he was quick to congratulate a fellow Yorkshireman on his win.
And after that great spin win for Mark Walsham, the riders then transferred from Norris to Great Yarmouth and another seaside resort. The race hadn't been here since 1960, and the weather was a little bit short of summer. The riders were asking the question, in fact, when would summer really begin? The Australians had come from temperatures of 30 degrees Celsius. The riders riding out of Great Yarmouth, were they holding together for a fast start, or were they staying together for warmth? And the answer, a fast start, because the rider in the black jersey, John Walshaw, was out for the early hotspot sprint. He took on the Soviet rider, Andrei Dolzhnitschka, and beat him well in the sprint. The Humberside professional was building for himself an early lead in that competition. The riders were facing up to 79 miles with a strong tailwind, and in the first hour they'd covered 29 miles. By the end of the day, they would have set a record speed for any milk race stage of over 29.25 miles an hour. The riders who came into base at Edmonds first were just a few seconds ahead of the field, but they included danger man Keith Reynolds. And with the referee saying that the time for the day would be taken the first time through the finishing line in Berry, there were 10 small laps of the town to come. It meant that Keith Reynolds would now climb to third place overall, because the main field were arriving 22 seconds later. So for the rest of the 10 circuits of the town, the battle was to be for the £1,000 first prize and the few seconds time bonus on the finishing line. With four circuits of the town done and six to go, the five early breakaways were caught by the whole field. Now the whole field were fighting out the first prize. It was a narrow, tight and twisting circuit and the 10,000 spectators seeing the milk race come to town for the very first time were treated to a great spectacle. This was one of the trickiest finishes you could imagine. The riders going through the corn exchange and down the back streets and they couldn't really see where the front of the bunch was anymore. So it was the riders prepared to take the risks who were to break away. And one rider did just this. Johan van den Dries from Belgium got clear with just three and a half laps of the town to go. The main field were too busy looking after the lampposts. Into a tight left-hander for the final time. Two Polish riders hit the straw bales and down they go. Uninjured, they simply had to remount and go home towards the finish. For the Belgian rider, this had been a magnificent day out, breaking away with just four laps to go. He'd showed extraordinary skills on the tight circuit. Now all that remained was to cross the line and take the biggest prize of his life, a thousand pounds. And for his Belgian team, it was their first ever victory in Britain. Okay, folks, now just a little the win by Van den Dries wouldn't affect the overall standings though. The race leaders had once again stayed together in the main pack. In the sprint for second place, Jerry Kuhlman was winning ahead of Martin van Steen of the Netherlands. And in fourth place, Chris Walker, the race leader. The fourth place though meant that Chris didn't take advantage of a small bonus, which only went down to third place. The photo finish came out. At first, the judges said Chris Walker was third. Then they changed their mind and confirmed Martin van Steen as the man in third place. The Belgian team, though, didn't really care. They had the thousand pounds and the stage winner on their squad. And when that was all over, then the scouts were out looking for the milk race winners of the years to come. At last, the riders were about to say goodbye to the East Coast on the fifth stage between Ipswich and Milton Keynes, the longest stage of the race, 125 miles. The riders weren't slow to react either because the minute the flag was dropped, there was an attack, and the rider on the attack was Jakob Auerkirk. He was quickly joined by Paul Leach, Darren Lawson, Ian Chivers, and the Netherlands teammate, Casper van der Meer, and the five riders rapidly gained time over a slumbering peloton. Chris Walker still led this race by 18 seconds from Simeon Hemsall, and none of the riders up front affected his lead at all, because the highest place rider was Paul Leach from New Zealand. He was 48th and over 17 minutes behind, so why hurry to catch them? But what the riders behind weren't expecting was the front five riders would share the pace so eagerly together, each one of them doing his turn at the front, and gradually the lead built to 19 minutes, and the new leader of the milk race now was Paul Leach by almost two minutes, number 122. The riders went through Saffron Walden at the 45 mile point. The Australian and New Zealand team managers couldn't believe their luck. The Australian manager in particular 
had missed the breakaway on that opening day on Humberside and was still cursing the fact that none of his riders were in the top positions. The Dutch riders in orange and the New Zealand boys in black and white have continued to try and control the pace of the peloton to good effect so that by the time the race came into Milton Keynes and the finishing circuit there they still had conserved 11 minutes of their 19 minute lead. There was no doubt now the winner was going to come from this leading group. Paul Leach, 122, 10 years a professional rider and a silver medalist in the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh in 1986. He'd never won a stage of the mill race though. By the time the main field joined the finishing circuit, they were in fact over two miles behind the leaders. And so it was left to the leaders to fight out the finish. They shed one rider in the sprint, and that was the man who started the breakaway, Jakob Auerkirk. The others, though, were looking for the thousand pounds. In the uphill sprint, it was Van der Meer who started the sprint for the line. He was quickly joined by Paul Leach, who slipped it up a gear. And then both riders had to take second place as Darren Lawson launched his sprint. The Australian who emigrated in Peacorps with his parents when 13 years of age is now an Australian national. And that meant that Darren Lawson became the first ever amateur rider from Australia to win a stage of the milk race. And the first to congratulate him, Paul Leach. Chris Walker brought the race home in the battle for sixth place, still proving he was the best of the rest and still keeping the overall lead in the race. He and his Banana Falcon team were still the riders to beat. Keith, are you surprised how the race has gone so far? No, not really. I expected it to be a tactical race with the format of the race. And it's uh, pretty much gone to plan so far. Who do you see as the danger man then, Chris? Um, there are a few teams that are strong. The, the, the Russians seem to be strong as a team. But they, they, so far they've missed every move and they've had to bring it back. So that's how we've seen the strong. So if they put a few attacks together, we're going to have to worry about them, I think. Is it reassuring you've got uh, two teammates within, uh, what is it, a minute, isn't it, to the overall? That's right, yeah, it makes, it makes my job a lot easier. If I miss something, I haven't got to go with everything. If I miss something, we've got two backup riders to go with it, and then they'll take the lead. Of course, the hills are starting to loom, and then there's no more time bonuses. What do you feel about that, Keith? Well, I'm quite confident about that, because the riders that are up there with Chris can climb as well as anyone else in this race, I'm sure. Um, so I think we'll consolidate this position next week. Do you see any big attacks developing on you over the next few days? Because you've got no allies, have you, in the bunch? No, I think that the main, da the dangerous stages um, could have been the last one or two days, you know, on the on the on the, on the flat stages with the wind. But um, fortunately for, for us, breaks have gone away with guys in it 17 minutes down from missing that that first uh, first break on the first day. And I'm very very surprised that um, a lot of the riders, which are poised in the two minute. Uh, group behind Chris at the moment have not used any of these moves to, as a platform for themselves. They're just not making any moves, which is playing into our hands because we're not bothered about chasing groups at 17 minutes now. It's the other teams that are missing out on tour. Day six from Kettering to Leicester, the shortest of the tour, over 64 miles. 91 starters set off, minus Adrian Timmis, who sadly crashed out, breaking his collarbone the day before. Timmis had been riding well and could have been a threat in the second week. Short stages often turn out to be fast and furious, and the early action centred on the King of the Mountains battle. The yellow jersey was obviously pleased with this, but it took the pressure off him. After the two climbs, New Zealander Tom Bamford increased his lead to 11 points over his nearest challenger. But the Russians had been riding to a game plan, working for Chikachin, who'd gained a first and second spot. It was a day where the pattern changed continually. Break after break developed, and they were all caught and wiped away in the wind. Nearing Saddington, Northern Ireland Milk Race winner Mark Kane took flight, but he was quickly swept up. In fact, just about every group was swept up. I think all the riders had read the handbook. For at Leicester, there were eight finishing loops waiting for them, and £150 for the first man over the line each time. And entering that finishing circuit, ten riders had took flight. Among them were three danger men. The closest to the yellow jersey, Russian Vladimir Abramov, was just 2.28 behind at the start. This meant that the Banana Falcons had got to chase. They all moved to the front of the field in team time trial fashion. There was no way the yellow jersey was going to give up without a chase. It went on to 1 minute 12 seconds. That was the maximum. Then it was slowly brought down. Two laps to go, two riders took off. Mark Gordon at the front riding for Great Britain and in the pink at the back, six times national cyclo cross champion Steve Dowse. 
both riders searching for their first ever milk race stage win. The man that led out clearly had the advantage on the downhill sprint. Dowse challenged hard on the left, but hadn't quite got enough to get level with Gornel. So Mark Gornel took the stage for Great Britain. The crowd waited to see how long it would be before the yellow jersey came in, for he had got to cut back on that time. The clock ticked on and it stopped 35 seconds after Abramov had gone over the line. So once again, he was safe. And so for the popular, confident Sheffield man, it was a seventh yellow jersey. If anything, the weather was even colder as the milk race entourage assembled for day eight of the milk race in Birmingham, the capital city of the Midlands. Spectators, officials and riders shivered in the biting wind and rain was forecast for the 66 mile figure of eight leg. The race speed so far had been almost 27 miles an hour and some of the field would be hoping for an easy day with a mountainous second week looming. No, not the Channel Tunnel, it's St Chad's and this would lead them onto the main road for Warsaw. It's even Stevens on stage win so far with four to the amateurs and four to the professionals. Leaving Scott Arms, two riders had gone clear. It was John Walshaw in the black jersey, the hotspot sprint leader, and John Hughes, the man that had placed third to Norwich. With points and a £500 prize available on their first return through the finish after 38 miles, it was a good move, and they began to work like a well-oiled engine. Roads became glacial from the rain, one of the conditions racing cyclists dislike. And when you're in a big field like this, caution is required. Shane Sutton, last year's winner, playing the role of domestic to the team in this year's race. He's had a share of problems this season with a broken bone in his wrist and bronchial troubles, but his tactical brain in the second week will be invaluable. He shaped his victory across the mountains to Aberystwyth on day three last year, so he was fully aware of the pressures Walker was under, for he'd been in yellow since day one. Hughes handed the prize to Walshaw on a plate, and the five points gave the British professional a 15-point cushion in the hotspot sprint competition. When they crossed the line next time, it would be for £1,000 and the stage. Patrick Yonker gained Australia's second stage of the tour with a superb attack around a kilometre from the line. The field was fragmented as they reached the finish, and Walker gained a further four seconds, stretching his lead over his nearest rival, Simeon Hemsel, to 22 seconds. Stay in Birmingham, the riders have gone down the M5 to Gloucester for the 117-mile stage to Swansea. It was to cross five mountains, and for almost a week now, the riders have been talking about the day everything would be sorted out. The sun was shining, the wind was strong, and the hills were high. Plump Hill took the riders into the Forest of Dean. Come Park would bring them out of the Welsh mountains and down to Port Talbot, and Swansea after that was only round the corner. The attack started straight away on the climb of Plump Hill, with Tom Bamford taking second place and a good start for him, and a day in the Welsh mountains when he had hoped to consolidate his lead in the King of the Mountains competition. Wales had never looked prettier, out of the Forest of Dean, across the River Usk, and then it was a left turn down the A40, and soon the mountain they feared most, the climb of the Tumnal. Shane Sutton had put in an attack. He remembered his days of a year ago on the road to Aberystwyth when he was in the lead too. What a combination! An Aussie, a Paddy and a Russian! <laughs> he chose some strange partners. He was now in the lead with Ian Chivers of Ireland and Oleg Polovnikov of the Soviet Union. Sutton's plan was to draw the sting of the rest of the race. Last year's winner was out front now, thinking more of his teammate Chris Walker, and the hope he would have a quieter day than he could surely have expected. The field stayed together as they began the climb of the tumble, and it was probably held by the fact there was a strong headwind. Four minutes ahead was Sutton, the Soviet rider, and the Irish rider now was missing. Halfway up the climb, he'd lost contact with the two leaders. But these two riders really didn't matter overall. Sutton was 59th over 17 minutes behind Chris Walker. Polovnikov was even further behind. He was 70th and 17 minutes 37 seconds back. The riders everybody wanted to see was Chris Walker and he was setting the pace on the climb. Instead of the riders attacking him who wanted the mountains, they were finding they were having to pay homage to the man who had led this race now for more than a week. Even Harry Lodge on the shoulder here of Chris Walker was expected to attack, but Lodge could only share the pacemaking. 
Chris Walker in the yellow jersey, who is now beginning to look like a real leader of this race. His fragile 22 seconds advantage over Simeon Hemsel was beginning to look quite a lot after all. Up front, over four minutes ahead, was Shane Sutton setting the pace and the tempo, carrying the number one as last year's winner. Team manager Keith Lambert was saying it's going exactly as we planned it, just keep the tempo steady. Chris is handling himself behind just fine. The plan at the start of the day by Banana Falcon had been to attack with either Chris Lillywhite or Shane Sutton. Lillywhite's attack at the very beginning had failed. Shane Sutton had worked. Everybody thought that the Australian was on poor form. Now he was out front and enjoying every minute of it. Got rid of the paddy anyway. Indeed they had. The most dangerous man in this leading group was the paddy, Ian Chivers, eight minutes back. He was now falling back to the field while the other two were making progress. The Welsh Hills continued into the Rhondda Valley, out of the Rhondda Valley, up the Rigos climb, until finally the final climb of the day, Cum Park. Once you're over the top of Cum Park, you face a 10-mile descent through Cunnanville. It was on that long descent where the two leaders surrendered, and the whole field caught them up. This in itself was a surprise. Instead of the riders fragmenting in the Welsh mountains, they were swooping down through Port Talbot and onto the finish in Swansea in a pack of 74 riders. There was now no further opportunity to attack Chris Walker because the hills were all behind the race. And so it was down to the big sprint finish in the Kingsway in Swansea. All 74 riders thinking of the thousand pounds. One sprinter from the Isoglass team was Jan Bogart. He was in with a chance now, he'd won one stage. But as Jan Bogart made his run, so too did the yellow jersey of Chris Walker. Finding a gap in the middle, Chris Walker hit the front. This was to be the day that Chris Walker was on the defense. It was also to be the day he would win his second stage. £1,000 in the bank for the Banana Falcon team. Chris Walker now had given the race the psychological boost they never wanted. He was winning on the day he was supposed to lose. So with no change in the overall classification, it was on to stage nine from Cardiff to Great Malvern. A ride of 99 miles which began as a pleasant meander through the grounds of Cardiff Castle. The start was still some miles away. Chris Walker all smiles after his surprising victory in Swansea. Tom Bamford was smiling too because he'd increased his lead in the King of the Mountains competition and there were more hills to come on this day to Malvern. It was a long ride with a helpful wind but when they get to Malvern the riders had to do three 6.5 mile laps and on each lap was a one in five climb. The hill started soon as they left Cardiff. They went up the hill and down the slope to Caerphilly. The climb of Thornhill, though, did not split the field. And Tom Bamford, the leader of the King of the Mountains, was about to win the sprint and increase his lead even further. His Russian shadow, Shersky Sheen, wasn't too far behind. But again, the surprises were coming from Chris Walker. He was even challenging here now, going over the top in third place. It was also the first full day of rain. It was cold and it was windy. One rider was anxious to get to Malvern early. He was the Great Britain rider, Tim Hall, from Liverpool. He attacked at 30 miles and was to spend the next 50 miles on his own. The field huddled together for warmth. They couldn't find anybody willing to take up the chase. But somebody did. In fact, four riders broke away at the feeding station at 63 miles and led by Steve Douse, the British professional, they caught the lone Tim Hall. He was the last with them for precisely one mile, and passing the gates of East Nor Castle, he was dropped. Douse and alongside him, Jakob Auerkirk of the Netherlands, Matt Pisano, the champion of Australia in white, and in the green, Kevin Kimmage of Ireland. Into the finishing circuit, one lap to go. Down goes Kimmage, the wheel spin on the greasy surface. It was a marvelous recovery by the Irishman, but this hill, as I say, is one in five and he needed quite a lot of help to get on the road again. Not only had he fallen, but his chain was off and the race was riding away from him. A good service from the Irish team mechanic, and Kimmage was back in the race. His time lost 20 seconds. He still had six and a half miles in which to make up lost ground. This is how it all happened. Watch his back wheel. He was on the wheel of Steve Douse, and also what's the orange jersey of Auerkirk? He had nowhere to go, he simply had to stop. Okay, 
So the crowd are anticipating now a victory for either Matthew Bozzano or Steve Douse. They were left out in the lead by some 20 seconds. The Irishman caught them both in the last kilometre, and the last man to be passed was Steve Douse, the professional. Banging his handlebars, second again, just as he had been in Leicester behind Mark Cornell. But no doubt about the winner, the first Irish winner of a stage in the milk race since 1984. And it was his brother Paul who was the last Irishman to wear the yellow jersey. That was back in 1983. Chris Walker finished in fifth place. Will this man ever give up? And the answer will probably be no. The Irishman, though, was happy enough. That was when he recovered from the most difficult race of his life. The neutralised flag at the Garrison Roundabout in Donington signalled the official start of Stage 10 from Telford Newtown to Sheffield over 87 miles. 87 of the original 101 riders were left with almost 900 miles in their legs. Simeon Hemsel was in good spirits after the start. He'd stalked Walker since his fine stage victory to Lincoln. He was racing to his hometown, an extra incentive to challenge for the yellow jersey. Spicy ingredients were in the recipe, including the long Merritown low climb just after Thorncliffe and Rousley Bar, a real brute and arguably the toughest ascent of the tour. 20 riders were ahead by Fortin and after only nine miles. Rob Holder, the Banana Falcon and England's David Cook, the only two from the top ten. Notable absentees were the yellow jersey, Paul Curran, Hemsel, Harry Lodge and the Soviet threat, Abramov. The break favoured Keith Lambert squad for Holden, last year's runner-up, had John Clay along for support. He would become the new leader if the move was to succeed. Kiwi Tom Bamford, who challenged for the King of the Mountains since day one, finally clinched the title with his second place to Russia's Oleg Polognikov at the summit of Meritone Low, and with still two more climbs to go. Hartington Village provided beautiful scenery for the race, which was now nearing Rousley and Chris Walker, the yellow jersey, was having to dig deep into his reserves for it incurred a rear wheel puncture at the foot of the climb. He received a quick wheel change from his team car and John Clay was ahead to help with the chase. The crowd chanted for the Yorkshireman, whose consistency throughout the race had been sheer brilliance. Nearing the peak of Rousley Bar, another Russian, Pavel Tonkov, the former junior world champion, had found an extra gear as he swept past Mark Walsham, had gone out alone in search of glory. The Russians in this race had showed glimpses of their strength and speed, but their tactics at times left a little to be desired. Walker was back at the head of the field, looking comfortable after his frenetic chase after the puncture, and now looking forward to the possibility of another stage victory in his native Sheffield. Walker's local knowledge of the finishing loops and John Clay's last lap attack helped the yellow jersey to his third stage victory. He rounded the final corner, denying Jan Bogart as he hit the line to complete a fine hat-trick. His lead stayed the same, but his wallet had swelled by another thousand pounds, and the crowd loved it. His mother was in the stand to see her son's triumph, and fiancé Lynn's eyes lit up at the canteen of cutlery he'd just won. penultimate ride of the tour from Sheffield to Leeds passed through Harworth, Barnsley, Huddersfield and Bradford along the 106 mile route. The day's plan for the yellow jersey and his team colleagues would be to stop any danger men getting away. They were packing strongly over Sprockborough Bridge after 40 miles of racing. Ahead were four riders who'd sped away at Bawtry. They'd built a lead of 10 minutes approaching Barnsley. The nearest to the yellow jersey was Dutchman Kasper van der Meer, who lay 8 minutes 24 seconds behind. With him was the American Jonas Carney, Peter Nasons of Kolstrop, and Johan de Vos of the SEFB Saxon. But it was a move that was always doomed, for the heads of the race were biding their time behind. Their lead was cut to 5 minutes, leaving Huddersfield, and with 8 miles to go, they were finally hauled in after almost 80 miles ahead. So once again, the milk race was setting itself up for another mass sprint finish. One rider using his local knowledge was John Clay from Horsforth, who broke clear two miles from home. And along the Kirkstall Road, looked a winner. 
but he faded as the field swallowed him up, entering the finishing straight. 25-year-old Belgian super sprinter Jerry Kuman, who twice placed second, made no mistake this time with a clear victory on the line from the yellow jersey, who once again had showed his classy sprinting power and his 22-second lead was still intact. The remaining 84 survivors assembled in Albert Square, Manchester for the final stage to Liverpool of the 1150-mile route which had started two weeks earlier on the east coast at Bridlington. And for Chris Walker, who signed on with Team Skipper, and last year's winner Shane Sutton, just 82 miles stood between him and a dominant victory of sheer consistency. Walker's team would never be far from his side in case of trouble, for a 22-second cushion was hardly a race-winning guarantee, and a puncture or mechanical defect could have been costly. Thousands turned out for the finale, and after 10 two-mile finishing loops in Liverpool, Belgium Jerry Kuman led the bunch into Castle Street to gain his second successive victory, but the race belonged to the yellow-jerseyed Chris Walker. What a rider. That took his tally of places in the top six to 11, with three wins and three seconds. And the 22-second lead he'd held since Birmingham was unchanged. He was also richer by £10,000, the overall first prize. Chris, when you got the yellow jersey in hold, did you believe you'd hold it all the way to the finish? Um, I was hoping to, but you never know what's going to happen, so uh, I was just going to try and do my best. I knew that I got two teammates behind me overall, so uh, if I was going to fail, they were going to jump into the jersey. The lead was always slender. Did you ever feel you would lose it? No, we had a team discussion, and uh, after about five days, we decided that that was enough, you know, that we were strong enough to defend it, and uh, we did, luckily enough. It's a bit naughty to ask you with your consistency, but did you ever have a, a sort of bad moment? Um, not really, no, not, not that I can think of. Just bad luck, really, like the staging to Sheffield where I punctured, but uh, I got back to the leader, so that was OK. Three marvellous stage victories. Which was the best one for you? Um, coming into Sheffield, really, because home crowd there. I, was, I wasn't really going to go for the for the win, but when I got onto the circuit, the crowd sort of lifted me, and I thought I'd better give it a go. And how much did the team help you? Uh, enormously. just couldn't have got through it without them. I mean, they were the strongest team. That's why we were able to defend it so long. Your finest victory, obviously. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thanks a lot, Hugh. Another trophy for the cabinet and a second victory in a row for the Banana Falcon team in the 1991 milk race. Well, that dominance by the Banana Falcon team reflected in three of their riders being placed in the top six. A good performance, too, by the England amateur team, with Simeon Hempsall also picking up the jersey for the best under-22 rider. Well, at this point in the programme, we were due to go to Queen's for the Stella Artois Championships, the semi-finals, but I'm afraid it's chucking it down. These are the scenes from Queen's at the moment, drizzling hard, the cover's on, and of course, once the cover's come off, it'll take about 20 minutes until the court is ready to play. We will, of course, 